Hello everyone and welcome to this, my 2023 Further Mathematics Written Exam 1 Suggested Solutions for the VCAR exam. Yes, my name's Darren from Maths Guru. Really good to see you. New and branded merchandise, he says. So excited, but you guys are like, shut up and get on with it. So let's do that. Right, what I'm going to do is work through each of the questions that were published in the Further Maths Written Exam 1 on Thursday, the 25th of May, 2023 for the Northern Hemisphere. Now, those of you who sat the exam, I hope you're going to forgive me, but I'm not going to do the solutions to linear or uh, geometry. And the reason being is because that's in the past now, the new study design basically uh, has got rid of that. And so uh, there are only questions on uh, networks and matrices. So I'm only going to do those sections for those students who are doing the exam coming up. And that may be in November of this year um, or, in fact, for the Northern Hemisphere coming up. Now, these are my suggested solutions. I don't work for VCAR. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they're going to let me work for them because I do these solution videos and they will undoubtedly think that I'm going to give, gr oh, I don't know, hidden information. But I do work with a lot of phenomenal teachers who are assessors and fingers crossed the information I will give you is true. If you can do me the massive favor, please, of subscribing to my YouTube channel. That means a huge deal to me. When people subscribe, I go nuts, like literally nuts. The reason being is because very few people watch math videos and uh, YouTube works on an algorithm. And so the people who subscribe tend to boost up my videos as well. So these exam solution videos hopefully uh, will help other people if you include or subscribe to my channel. Right, enough of that rubbish. Let's get going on. So what you'll notice is I'm scrolling through the paper. This page is blank. That's very kind. All right, let's start off with the data analysis sections. Right, let's get into question number one. Data analysis, or sorry, try the one again. Data relating to the following five variables just collected for trees on a farm. Age, type of fruit, deciduous height of tree, circumference. The number of ordinal variables in the above list is ordinal. Right, it's got to be categorical, got to have some sort of implied order. Age, and that, that's numerical. Type of fruit, uh, try up of tree, fruit or not fruit. Well, that's definitely categorical, but I can't put fruit or not fruit in an order. Deciduous, yes or no. Again, categorical, but yes or no doesn't have an implied order. Height of tree certainly does because it's small or short, medium or tall. And circumference, uh, nope, that is also a numerical. So the number of ordinal variables in the above list, I think has got to be B. All right, so B would be my answer to that one there. All right, so now moving on to question two, the shape of the distribution is best described. Okay, the histogram, uh, I'll try again. The histogram below shows the distribution of the volume in cubic meters of the trunks of 31 black cherry trees. The shape of the distribution is best described as, and we want to hear the word best described, all right? So symmetric, no, I don't think that's symmetric. Negatively skewed, nope, that doesn't appear to be negatively skewed. And again, if you don't know the difference, always put them in your summary book. Symmetric, definitely not. All right, so, Got to, again, is that an outlier? I tend to really not like these type of questions, but again, it wants the best. Negatively skewed with an outlier. Nope, I don't think so. Positively skewed with an outlier. I'm going to go with that one there, right? So again, just looking at my summary notes of what a positively skewed graph looks like, I'd probably be best to go for that one there. Question number three, the percentage of trees that have trunks with a volume between 1.2 and 2.2 meters cubed. All right, so if we go back to my graph, I grab my pen. Uh, let's see what we can do here. So what was it between 1.2? So there's my 1.2 line and between 2.2 is here. Now it wants percentage of trees and we have to be very careful because they've tried to trick us here with a frequency. So what do we got here? We got one and that's four. And that's one and one. So four, five, six, seven. So Trev, seven trees in total out of a total of, how many did you tell me? 31. And, and the times that by 100. Let's fire up my calculator. Now I'm going to use the TI and Inspire guys. If you're a class pad user, I'm really, really sorry. I'd love to do the answers for both calculators, but it really would blow out the video. So if I do 30, uh, 7 divided by 31 times that by 100, I'm going to get 22.6. And so it wants the closest, and in which case I'm fairly sure. Therefore, I'm going to have my answer as A. Awesome. Let's keep going. The third quartile for this distribution in meters cubed could be. Right. So again, I've seen this question before. And in fact, I think it was on uh, the uh, 2022 exam in November. So the third quartile for this distribution could be, well, if it's the third quartile, I'm looking for uh, to split my data. Now, again, in this situation, I know I've got 31 data items. So I know now I'm going to have 15 data items on one side. I'm going to have a central data item 
and then another 15 on the other side, okay? So there we go. So I know I can split it now into the N15. Those N15 again, I know I'm gonna have seven data items, then my upper quartile, and then another seven data items. Now again, what I mean by that is I'm gonna look here for my eighth data item from the end. How are we gonna do that? Well, we know there's one there, there's one there, there's four there, and there's one there. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. My eighth data item must fit in this bar here, which goes between one and 1 1.2. So the only value that I can see that is between one and 1 1.2 would be C. So there we go. So I'm gonna go for C as my correct answer there. Whew. Slamming through this. Right, next question, what do we got? The scatter plot below shows the volume of trunks of 31 black cherry trees plotted against the height of the trees in meters. Okay, the volume, uh, the least squares line with height as the explanatory variable has also been fitted to the scatter plot. Oh, right, let's go then. So let's scroll that up a moment so I can see the question. When the least squares line is used to predict the volume of a tree with height 25 meters. Now again, I know here that if it's a residual, it's the difference between this line here and the data point that we've actually got. So we're looking for a height of a tree with 25 meters. So if I go 25, let's look at that. Well, it's only that one there, all right? So again, we're looking for this 25 and trying to find which point lies on that line and there's only one of them. And now what I'm looking to do is find that distance between them, all right? Now again, this is gonna be interesting to try and work out. So this point here seems to be, he says going across there about 1.1. So let's say we got the 1.1 as my predicted. My actual is sort of here, and let's take that across, which is 1.5. So there's 1.5, and it's my actual minus my predicted. So I want 1.5 minus 1.1, which is about roughly 0.4. So we're looking for something roughly close to 0.4. It's gotta be positive. The only answer there would appear to be D as 0.5. And again, reading these things off of graphs is really, really cool. The equation of the least squares line is closest to. Ooh. Now, the biggest trick with this question here, and let's see if we can do it by a process of elimination first, is to actually understand that this point here is not my intercept. It is not my y-axis intercept. That is only true when this value here is zero. So VCAR try and trick people over and over again to test your understanding of that point. Right, so first things first, what do I know? I've got my response variable and I've got my explanatory variable. So my formula has to start with volume equals, right? Shucks, they all start with volume equals. Right, well, what's the next thing I'm gonna be able to do? Hmm. Uh, probably discount anything that is at 0 0.1, anything that starts with 0 0.1, I'm gonna get rid of, all right, as that value there, because, well, my intercept is not 0 point anything. All right, what else have I got? My volume is equal to minus 2.4, point, right. To be honest with you now, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to fire up my calculator again. I think it's still showing, if I remember rightly. Let me just have a look. Yep, it's still showing. So what I'm now gonna do is gonna control doc and I'm gonna add a list in the spreadsheet. And I'm gonna do a regression analysis, but I'm not gonna put all the points in. I'm actually just gonna put two points in. So I'm gonna do a height and I'm gonna do weight. And I'm just gonna find two points that are roughly on my uh, least squares regression line, because then I'm basically gonna have information that my calculator can use to try and find my regression line. So I'm gonna to to use those two points there I've just highlighted in green. So what do we got there? We've got a height of let's say 19, Point 0.2, so 19.2, and I'm gonna do tab, and I got 0 0.123, so 0 0.3 as my, uh, I don't know why I call that weight, let's call it volume, and let's call that 0 0.3. Uh, yep, 0 0.3, okay, and then the next one is about 23.8, 23.8, and that's got a volume of, oh, I don't know, 0 0.95, now again, it doesn't have to be accurate, guys, in any way, shape, or form, because I'm just trying to find the one that's gonna get closest. What do I do now? Control, doc, let's add the data and statistics. There's my two points. What's along the bottom? I've got height. What's up there? I've got volume. There's my points. Menu, analyze, regression, uh, A plus BX, and there we go, there's my, now again, you're not gonna find one that's exactly the same as that. I'm just trying to find one that's roughly close to that. So roughly minus 2.4 something, 
All right, so I want my volume equals minus 2.4 something equals 0.14 something. And there we go. So I think the only one that I can actually choose there is actually going to be A, because that's the one that fits the closest to my calculator. Oh, so exciting. All right, let's turn my calculator off for a moment and let's go to the next question. I'm rather too um, into this. All right. The residuals for this least square line have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0.37. The standardized value of one of the residuals that is 0.81. The actual value of the residual is closest to that. And again, they did this uh, in, in sort of November. We know the Z score is equal to the, the actual value. Let's call it X minus mu on sigma. All right. So that's X minus mu on sigma. All right. So we got the standardized value as minus 0.81. We're trying to find the actual residual. Again, it doesn't have to be the actual value. It can be the actual residual, which is what the question is doing here. Minus the mean of zero divided by the standard deviation of 0.37. All right, so when I put that into my calculator, let's show my calculator. Yes, I could use solve, but again, in this situation, it's just it's simply just a 0.37 multiplied by negative 0.81. Hit enter gives me minus 0.2997, so minus 0.3. I'm reckoning that's going to give me B as my correct answer. There we go, B as minus 0.3. Now, don't get confused there. I know it talked about your standardized residual. It doesn't really matter. Normally, we have standardized scores, but a residual, we can do the same thing. Oh, the table in the data, the data in the table below was collected in a study of the association between having symptoms of respiratory disease, yes and no, and level of expertise, pardon, try again, uh, exposure to the component of a product in unlimited height that is expected to cause respiratory problems. 500 people were surveyed, good. The percentage of workers with symptoms of respiratory disease in this study is the percentage of workers with symptoms of respiratory disease. So symptoms, yes. Um, the percentage of the workers with symptoms of respiratory disease in this study is, all right, so we've got all of these workers have symptoms of respiratory disease. So what I'm going to do, I may as well leave my calculator on for the whole uh, of this video. 17, we're going to add that to 33, we're going to add that to 185, and then that gives me 235 people. So let's not do that in highlighter. 235 out of how many people did it tell me there were? Uh, did we do that? Yeah, 500 people. So there's 500. I'm going to times that by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So 235 divided by 500 and times that by 100 is going to give me 47%. All right, so D, 47%, I think, is the correct answer. Which of the following statement supports the contention that increasing exposure of workers to the product is associated with having symptoms of respiratory disease? Whoo, okie dokie. So... First things first, um, I'm going to discount A, B, and C straight away, all right? The reason I'm going to discount those is because it doesn't actually have um, all of the statistics we need. Whenever you write these, you've got to give, well, certainly more than one statistic. So I'm going to get rid of A, B, and C before I even start there. All right, it's got to be between D and E. Now, when we do these, if you remember, we have to percentage by column. So the first thing I need to do is work out how much each of those columns are. So I'm going to do 17 plus 72. And you're going to say, why didn't I do that in my head? And I'm going to say to you, because I don't want to make a mistake, to be perfectly honest with you. 89, let's do the 33. And I want to add that to the 73. It gives me 106. And then 185 plus 120 gives me 305. Okay, so those are those people there. What do I now want to do? I want to percentage each of those values. I'm just going to choose one of them for the moment. And so I'm going to choose this 17, All right? So I'm going to percentage this 17 out of a total of 89 and use my calculator to do that. So 17 divided by 89 gives me about 19%. All right, so about 19%. Uh, so I'm going to put about 19% there. And then I'm going to do 72 divided by 89 hit enter, and what am I going to have? 81%. 81%, 81% there. All right, again, I'm going to do the same in the next column. 33 divided by 106 gives me 31. And then what have I got here? Uh, 73 divided by 106 gives me about 71%, 71 i uh, try that one again, because my values didn't add up. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. 106 gives me 69%, yeah. 
And then 185 divided by 305 gives me 61. And then 120 divided by 305 gives me 39. Okay, so 39. Now what I'm going to try and do is work out which of my percentages fits with those tables. Right, 1931 and 61 seems to be E there as my correct answer. So I'm going to put E as my correct answer because that's the one that all of my percentages seem to fit. All right, so moving on to question number 10. The time series plot is best described as having because we've given a time series plot displaying the quarterly sales in millions of dollars for a manufacturer during the period of 2000 to 2007. Quarterly sales, all right, seasonality, yay, love, love, love. So four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12, 15, uh, was it eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then 20, and so we go on. Right, okay then, so what I'm gonna do is just highlight dots on each of those lines. There's a dot, there's a dot, there's a dot, and there's a dot, and there's a dot. And the reason I'm doing this is because seasonality basically has to repeat uh, over a time period of less than one year, or a you know, year or less. So, regular fluctuations only. Nope, it wants the best one, so we're not gonna say that. Uh, a decreasing trend, uh, absolutely can't see there's a decreasing or an increasing trend, so I'm gonna get rid of those only. Seasonality only, uh, okay. Seasonality with the regular fluctuations. I'm actually gonna choose C straight away. The reason being is because every single time series plot has uh, regular fluctuations. And in this question, they didn't tell me to ignore those irregular fluctuations, in fact. Um, so I'm gonna go with seasonality with the regular fluctuations. I just wanna then check and see whether this does. So it goes up, down, up. A little bit down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up. Okay, so I'm going to go with seasonality. Again, I massively respect anybody who can look at these questions and go, yeah, 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 I know this. The seven median smooth sales in millions of dollars for quarter eight is. So seven median. Right, so what I'm going to do is rub all those dots out, and then I'm going to do my seven median scaled, what did it say? around quarter eight. So five, six, seven, eight, I know that one's there. Seven dots, uh, with one in the middle means three either side. So one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Now if I had a ruler I could use, then I would absolutely be using it at this moment in time. But what I'm now trying to do is find the fourth highest dot as I go up the page. So there's one, two, three, and there we go. So there's my fourth highest dot. So I'm gonna read across to that value there which is, what is that gonna be? 19246, 196. So I'm gonna go with B as my correct answer. Okay, and median smoothing, mean smoothing, Awesome, awesome, awesome. Love, love, love. The table below shows the number of hours worked each week by casual staff in a coffee shop over a 14 week period. The eight mean smooth value with centering for week seven is closest to, and there we go. They love these questions. Right, when I do this type of question, so what I say is what well, we are centered for week seven. So the first thing I do is, is I do a value on the left hand side of the seven, and I want eight mean smoothing. So that means I need four values on the left and four values on the right. So my calculator is gonna be coming greatly useful here. So 58 plus 29 plus 28 plus 32 plus 38. And I keep checking my calculator to make sure that I'm putting the right answers in. 48 plus 38, make sure that they are all there. Divide by eight is gonna give me 38.25. So I've got 38.25, that's for the left. So what am I now gonna do? Rub all that out, and I'm gonna do the right-hand side of seven, and the same thing there. I'm gonna take my four values to the left of that line and four values to the right of that line. Now, obviously, the good thing is what I can do with my calculator is copy that down. I'm gonna add on 39, because effectively, seven of those numbers were already shared, but I'm gonna get rid of the 58 at the beginning, just to save myself some time, and divide that by eight, because I want mean, which is gonna give me 30, 5.875, I'm gonna add those two together, which is gonna give me plus uh, 38.25, 74.125, and then divide by two, because the centering you've gotta basically do either side of the seven, add the two values together and divide by two. So let's divide that by two, is gonna give me roughly 37.0625. It wants it closest to, I'm gonna say 37, so C, 
would be the answer that I would suggest is actually going to be correct there. Okay. Now moving on to question 13, the seasonal index for sales in a clothes shop in October is 1.65. This tells us that October sales tend to be, well, 1.65 is basically 165% of the average. So 165% of the average, which basically tells me, well, that if 100 is the average, it is 65% above my average sales. That was a nice, easy question. Normally they ask you to correct for seasonality. We've got away lightly on that one. So let's move this up and let's keep going. What do we got here? Ooh. The time series plot is linearized by applying a square transfer formulation to the variable t. A least squares line is fitted to the transform data. The equation of this line is. Now, again, they tend to always try and get you to do one of these in every paper. So what I'm going to do is do exactly that. So I've got t and I've got y. The values on my calculator, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Put this into my calculator. Scrolling up. Now, again, when you put these values in, make sure you get them correct. I'm absolutely looking every single time. It might take you 10 seconds longer, but those 10 seconds can actually gain you the mark that your fingers might lose you if you don't check the value. So there we go. There are my values. Again, I'm now going to flip over here. I've already got a graph. I'm just going to change that. Ah, no, I'm not. Oh, RTQ. What did it say? I wanted a square transformation. So I tend to do uh, T squared, but equals there my var. I'm going to do var of T, and I'm going to raise that to the power of two. There's my new values there. Now I'm going to go back to this graph here. So what have I got here? T is on the bottom. So I'm going to have T squared versus my y value there we go and the animation and there we go there is my uh, equation now again remember that your calculator is a dumb piece of machinery it's got the y and x there i do wish it would put the t squirt where the x is because it knows what the x axis is called but anyway let's not get let's not uh, split hairs because there's really not a lot there so i would be looking for my y to be equal to 12 point what's that value 9.2 plus 4.83 times t squared. And you obviously want this t squared in there. So which one of those is that? 12.92 plus 4.834 t squared. It's going to give me e, I believe, as my correct answer. Here we go. E is my correct answer. Let's continue on. The time series plot can also be linearized by applying a log 10 transformation to the variable y. When a least squares line is fitted to the transform data, the equation of this line is given by that. This equation is used to predict y when t equals 11. The value of y is... All right, so this is a nice solve question. All right, but again, I'm going to use my financial... Uh, financial. I'm going to use my solve function here. So menu, algebra, solve. I'm going to put my equation in there. So log of y is equal to... Oh, now do you see what we've got here? We've got a bit of a problem there because it's got my y as bold. So what I'm actually going to do... Is I'm going to, what's the best thing to do here? Menu, let's see what happens when I do action, clear, and let's clear my A to Z. And that can't accept change variables in use because I've got that table there. So what I'm actually going to do is delete all of this. No, I don't want to save the diagram. Let's start afresh and let's do this here now. So we've got solve log of Y is equal to 1.214 plus 0.1657 times uh, now we know my t value was 11 and i could put comma y hit enter and there you go 1088.178 e is my correct answer now again i think that's quite interesting don't be afraid to close that diagram down or close that down uh, but just me make sure you're not going to use that data again but it wasn't a particularly long question so you could always type them in a food van operates in an industrial area from Monday to Friday. The table below shows the seasonal indices for the daily sales food for this fan. The seasonal index for Wednesday is missing. Missing? Missing. Okay, the following equation can be used to forecast the daily deseasonalized sales for each day. The actual sales for Wednesday is. Right, first thing we've got to realize is we know that all of these values here have to add to the number of day columns that I have, all right? So they've got to add to the number of columns I've got. So I'm going to do 1.25 going to add that to 1.1, add to 
0.85 and I'm going to add that to 0.9 and that's going to give me that. I've got five columns minus my 4.1 gives me 0.9. So that value there has got to be 0.9. Ka-ching. All right, so what we got here, D seasonal A sales is given by, uh, that by that, the actual sales is given by, all right, day number is three, so my D seasonal A's, let's work that out, is going to give me 4207.9 plus 135.31 times my day number, which is three, all right, so take that to my calculator, it's going to give me 4207.9. Plus 135.31 times my day number, which is three. It gives me that 4613.83. And I know that my D seasonalized is also equal to my actual divided by my seasonal index. So if I want my actual, I'm going to do my D seasonalized multiplied by my seasonal index, which is going to be 4613.83. And I'm going to multiply that by 0.9. So let's do that now. So let's do my answer, please, times 0 0.9. Gives me 4152.4. Four, let's write that properly. 4152.447. Which one is that going to be closest to? Uh, 4152B. There we go. So again, that was interesting because you needed two pieces of information there. You needed to work out that how do you find that missing value there. That's nice and easy, but also you needed to know your DCs and nice formulas. But these should all be in your summary book to make life that little bit easier. Oh, now we move on to the fun stuff, recursion and financial modeling. Now, if you haven't already done so, can you do me a massive favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel? It really does mean the world to me if you can do that. All right, so Maps Guru and just click that button. Enough notifications if you want, but just the fact that you've watched this video you click that button means the world to me i'm seriously means the world to me all right let's continue enough of that rubbish question number 17 a sequence of numbers is generated by the recurrence relation shown below the first negative term in the sequence is oh interesting whenever i do these i literally put the value in and i use my ans button so i'm gonna do ans minus four and you can turn and say well this is overkill but that's okay so t0 t1 t2 T3, there you go, T3, I think B is gonna be my correct answer. And knowing how to use your calculator there to do that ANS minus plus or whatever else actually becomes really, really useful. Questions 18 and 19, you can use the following table. Eddie has a reducing balance loan. <laughs> Eddie in Victoria is going to cost him a fortune. Interest is calculated monthly. And Eddie, oh, that's important. I'm going to highlight that because financial questions, whenever they've got those, Eddie makes monthly repayments. Now that tells me that each of the lines in this amortization table is a monthly payment. Right? Four lines of the table for Eddie's loan are shown below. The balance of Eddie's loan after payment number three is. All right, well, okay. This is a lovely calculator question in many cases because what you've got to do is you've got to work out, well, where do each of these values come from? How do I get $1,094.51? Well, how did I get that? Well, my payment minus my interest. If I take those away, so I can now find this value here by doing that minus that. All right, let's just put that into my calculator, 2634.51. I'm going to take away 1531.96. Hit enter, it gives me 1102.55. Awesome. 1102.55. Right, how do I now get my next value? Well, it, this value here is always created by doing that one minus that one. So if I do this value minus that value there, and again, it gives you the hint because it says principal reduction, 417806.97. And I'm going to subtract from that 1102.55. Gives me 416704. So I'm going to write that one down. 416704.42. The balance of Eddie's loan after that payment is, do I have that one? 416704. Yep, B is going to be my correct answer to that one there. Right, what's the next one? The interest rate per annum. Oh, this is the one. All right, they do this all the time, all right? Being able to read, am uh, read amortization tables is massively important, particularly to work out how to get an interest rate. And the interest rate is always that payment there divided by the balance that created it, all right? So that interest there divided by that one times by 100. But that will be your monthly, weekly, whatever each of these lines stands for, that will be that interest rate. That's not your annual or nominal. So if I now do 1540 
divided by 420, 1, 2, 3, and times it by 100, I'm going to get 1540 divided by 420, 1, 2, 3 gives me, times that, no, not divide it, times that by 100 gives me that. That's my monthly percentage rate. So I'm now going to multiply that by 12, which is going to give me 4.4%. All right, so 4.4%, I believe, is my correct answer. Lots of people use formulas for these type of things. I, I can't. I can't do it. It just, just doesn't make sense. The value of a computer purchased for $6,000 is depreciated by a flat rate of 8% per annum. That means it's going to go down by a fixed rate. Okay, so 8% of the original one. So the first thing I'm going to do is work out 8%. So 8 divided by 100, and I'm going to times that by 6,000 gives me $480. So I now know that this is going to go down $480 every single time. All right. Which one of the following current relationship models the year-to-year -year value? All right, so our current relationship has to start with V0 equals 6,000. They all do. V of N plus 1 equals V of N equals, right, well, first things first, I'm looking at these, and it can't be C, D, or E. The reason being is that is not linear. They would actually be geometric, so, and this is linear because it's flat rate. All right, so basically, uh, I'm just looking for the one with VM minus 480. So as far as I would be concerned, A there would be my correct answer. The rule for the future value of an asset after end depreciation periods is given by that. The method used for depreciating the value of the asset could be. Well, basically what we're doing is we're taking some sort of fixed amount, this 4,000, and we're taking away n lots of 20. So again, this is very, very linear. Reducing balance only. I don't know. Let's think. Mm, flat rate, no. Unit cost only. All right. So, okay, reducing balance tends to be multiplied by... Uh, some sort of decimal. I don't think it's going to be that one. Unit cost only. Well, I could automatically plonk for that one, but it says mm, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba method could be right, either flat rate or reducing balance. No, nope, we don't like that one. Either flat rate or unit cost. Yes, because we don't actually know the context of the question. I would suggest here that the best one there would be flat rate or unit cost. They are both linear. And which one we use very much depends on the context of the question, right? But again, they're pretty much the same formula. Question 22. James invests an amount of money in a perpetuity. VCAR last year were very unpleasant, I think, in their uh, examiner's report, uh, basically saying that they are surprised that so many students really do not understand what a perpetuity is. Basically, the money in the account never changes. Your principal value, your future value, exactly the same. All right, so it earns interest at a rate of 3.6% per annum. For this perpetuity, interest is calculated and paid monthly. All right, well, the first thing I'm going to do is going to do 3.6 divided by 12 because I'm going to look for my interest rate there of 0.3. He says writing in a highlighter again, 0.3. All right, what happens next? I don't know. Let's read the rest of the question. If James receives a regular monthly payment of 1440, then the balance of the perpetuity after one year of monthly payments is, then the balance of the perpetuity after. So basically, they just want to know what the perpetuity was. Right. Can we do that? James receives a regular monthly payment of $1,400. Then the balance of the perpetuity after one year of monthly payments is. All right. Okay. So I know that 1440 is 0.3% of my value of my perpetuity, all right? Um, yep, so 0.3% of, duh, 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 let's call it X, is $1,440, right? So if I do 0.3 divided by 100, I'm going to of, all right, so now I'm going to do 1440 divided by that answer is going to give me $480,000, $480,000. And there we go. So actually, I don't multiply that anything. I don't have to worry about, you know, each month. That 0.3%, that interest, that monthly interest is coming directly from this $480,000. That's the value of my perpetuity. So C is going to be my correct answer. Here we go here. Mo invested 1,000. Let's go down. I don't like that black line there. Mo invests $10,000 into an account that earns interest compounding fortnightly. Let's highlight that. That's important. The balance in dollars after N fortnights can be modeled by the recurrence relationship shown below. The effective annual interest rate. Oh, this is a calculator function. We like that. Now, the first thing we're going to do is realize that this value here is nominal. All right, so that's my fortnightly interest rate. So I'm going to try and work out what my nominal interest 
uh, rate is first. So the way we're going to do that is I'm going to use a wonderful formula, which is R is equal to capital R minus 1 times 100 times by M. All right? Now that's basically N is my compounding period. R is this value here. So it's 1.001, he says, minus 1 times 100 times my compounding formula. Well, these are fortnights, and they're 26 fortnights in a year. So 1.001, subtract 1, times 100, and times that by 26. It gives me 2.6%. Now, again, be careful. That's my nominal interest rate, 2.6%. I'm now going to go menu, finance, interest conversions, and effective interest rates. And I'm going to say my nominal interest rate was 26 comma, my compounding periods was 26, hit enter, it gives me 2.63%. So D is going to be my correct answer, all right? And again, whenever you see those type of questions, make sure this is in your summary book. It's really, really helpful where R is your annual interest rate and that sort of little R is your annual interest rate, capital R is this value here, and N is your number of compounding periods. Right, let's keep going. Question 24, Rula takes out a reducing balance loan of that with an interest rate of that per annum compounding monthly. This loan is repaid monthly with equal payments over 15 years. In addition to those scheduled repayments, Rula decides to pay an additional amount of that per month to fully repay the loan sooner. The total amount of saved by Rula by making the additional monthly payments is, right, this is basically a two-part question. So first things first, I'm going to fire up my finance solver. Right, so let's just see how much she would have paid in total first if she had just continued uh, doing this without making scheduled repayments. So she's taking out a loan, so 15 years, so 15 and it's monthly times 12. Interest rate there was 3.64. Principal value, she's taken out loan, given money, so it's very positive. No payment at the moment. Future value is going to be zero. That's going to be 12 and 12 and 12. Okay, so let's work out how many payments she's going to make. So there we go. So initially, if she hadn't made these additional payments, she is basically going to be paying 3175.82 per month. Now, Overall, that means she's going to make 180 payments. So if I multiply that by 180, so if I do now do 3175.82 times 180, hit enter, that means she would have paid back, uh, he says, writing a 7, $571,647.60. All right, that's how much she would have paid back to the bank. Right, so what do we do now? Well, let's work out what happens if she makes those payments. Let's go back to my finance solver, finance solver. All right, so what she's actually going to do is she's going to make additional payments of 299.52. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract from that another $299.52. So we now know the payment. So I want to see how much, how much quicker she's going to pay this loan off. So there we go. So she's actually going to do that. She'll clear her loan in 160 months. Right, so 160 months. And in that situation, again, we can highlight this value here. She's going to pay 3475.34, yeah? So because she's paying more, she's going to clear her loan much, much quicker. So that's why we had to find a value of N, yeah? Because that's the only thing that wasn't changing. We, we knew that she was going to have a final value of zero. We knew her principal value was going to be 440,000. The interest rate stayed the same. The only thing that changed for that part of the question was her payment which meant I had to go and do this. So, right, let's go and back to this one here. And now let's do 3475.34 times that by 160 payments in this situation tells us that she will pay back 5560054.40. Now, what she saved, I'm going to do that minus that, 15,000. So by doing that, subtracting that, she's going to say $15,593.20, which one's that going to be 5593, giving me A as my correct answer. Whew. And there's the end of section A. That there was the core stuff, all right? So that's relevant to the new study design. Let's go on to our modules, and we're going to kick in with matrices, all right? Some people love matrices, other people, yeah, not so much. Which is the following, which one of the following is not an example of a square matrix, is not an example of a square matrix. All right, so an inverse matrix is square. That's definitely square. Transition matrix is definitely square. Permutation is definitely square. Communication is definitely square. A state matrix, what on earth is a state matrix? 
But if you remember, when you have transition diagrams, what do you multiply them by? A state matrix. Ah, so in this situation, we're going to go state matrix. Nice first question. Hmm. Okay, so now moving on to question two. But before I do that, have you subscribed to my YouTube channel? If you haven't, it really does mean the world to me. At the end of the day, when I get three subscribers, I run around the house like a lunatic. The dog thinks I'm nuts. I mean, talking about the dog now, he's lying here going, why are you talking to yourself again? Well, I'm talking to myself to do these videos for you guys. And just clicking that button means an absolute world to me. Right? If I can get 10 subscribers from this video, great. Turn off notifications if you never want to hear from me again. But YouTube will pick up on the fact that my subscribers have grown. And it does mean the world to me. And hopefully more students out there will find these videos and my content on mathsguru.com. All right, that's the needy stuff over. I'll do it again later, but let's do it now. Question two, students can select one elective subject from woodwork, fashion and coding. Matrix A shows that. For class A, matrix B shows the number of students in class B who choose each elective when matrix A is added to matrix B. Now, I, a minute ago when I did this question, I thought it was multiplied. I was like, you can't multiply these together. They're not, that's okay. It wants them to be added. The resulting matrix shows the total number of students in class A, nope. The total number of students in class B, nope. The total number of students in both classes, nope, because it's talking about total number of students, no. The total number of students in both classes A and B who choose each elective, yes, that's what's going to happen. Because if I do that, 12 plus that, that's going to tell me how many people are doing woodworking. Those two added together, those two added together, ka-ching. Life is good. I think it's got to be D as my correct answer. There we go. I'm not even going to read E. Yes, I am. The difference in numbers, no difference is when you would take them away. Let's keep going. Which one of the following matrix product does not produce a matrix with five rows and three columns? Well, this is basically saying, do you know how to do the orders of matrices? So it's rows by columns. So that's going to be a five by one. And that's a one by three. That's going to give me a five by three. Yes. But the question is trying to trick us and says which one does not. So in which case that does give us, so it's the wrong answer. Try again. What have we got here? We've got a five by... 2 and a 2 by 3. Oh, that is, but no, that's not the one we're looking for. What about this one? 1, 2, 3. That's going to give me a 3 by 5 and a 5 by 3. That's going to give me a 3 by 3. Do I need to go any further? Probably not. If I'm fairly confident with what I'm going to do, C is my correct answer. But let's just go through to make sure. 1, 2, 3, 4. That's a 5 by 4. And that's a 4 by 3. And that, and that one there is a 5 by 3 and a three by three. And again, that will. So C, I'm liking this paper so far. That means it's undoubtedly gonna get horrible soon. A cinema increases the cost of a child's ticket, an adult's ticket, and a senior's ticket by the same scale art factor A. The increase is found by completing the following calculation. The value of X is equal to, okay. So if I do 13.80 divided by 11.5, that's going to give me that value of A because it's a scalar. It means that this value here is multiplied by that to give me this. And A times that gives me this and so on. So I should be able to undo that scalar by simply um, finding the value of A or dividing 13.8 and divide that by 11.50 gives me 1.2. Now, why am I happy that that's probably good? Because it's a nice number. Right, so how do I find my value of x? Well, I'm now going to do 1.2, and I'm going to multiply it by 15. So 1.2, and I'm going to times that by 15, if you'd be so kind, is going to give me 18. And so in which case, I'm going to go with E as my correct answer. Okay, now moving on to question five. The following matrix shows the possible flight routes to and from five towns neighbored U, W, X, Y, and sorry, <laughs> V, W, X, Y, and Z. All right, one in the matrix shows that a town in the row is connected by a direct route to a town in that column. For example, the one in row two, column four, shows that a direct flight can go right. How many ways can people travel from Y to V? Oh, that's cool. Right, so we want to go from Y. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to color in my Y. And I'm going to say, well, okay, so Y can go to X. And Y can go to V. And Y can go to Z. That's cool. Right, well, in which case, I've already got one route there. So I'm going to highlight that one as my Y to V. Right, let's look at Y to X. So if I now highlight my X row, what have I got there? <clears throat> I've got X can go to W. All right, so X can go to W. So there's W. And what about Z? So let's have a look at the Z. Z can go to Y. Well, there's no point putting that one down. But Z can go to V as well. So there we go. I've got my Y to my V. So there's another route. So let's look at this one here. 
Y to X to W. Right, let's highlight my W. Let's see what I'm doing everywhere. I'm seeing a one and I'm just building up my roots one by one by one. So Y, so W can go to V, awesome. So that can go to V. W can go to X, well, we've already got that one. W can go to Y, we've already been there. And W can go to Z, okay, oh, there we go. And we know from this one here that Z can go to V. And so what have I got there? One, two, three, four different routes. So I'm gonna go for D as my correct answer. Okay, now looking at question number six, and no word of a lie, it's taken me 20 minutes to get my head around this one, and you can see all the types of things I was looking at on the CAS here, all of which I'm going to delete, because believe it or not, they don't work. But it comes down to some very interesting and a very uh, small fact that, believe it or not, Google helped me with, and undoubtedly your teachers have shown you, and I'm actually gonna go and make sure next week I show my students. Rightio, so it goes. Matrix P, Q, and R are square matrices. Matrix P is the inverse of matrix Q, okay. Matrix R is the transpose of matrix P. Okay, right, so what do we find here? Uh, what else do we know? Matrix R is the transpose of matrix P. All three matrices are defined if. Q to the minus one. So what I'm gonna do now is say, well, okay, we now know that Q to the minus one is P. All I've done is taken this one around here and moved it. So, right, the inverse of Q gives me P. So let's look at these two here. First things first, can either of these have an inverse? Well, we know that the inverse is only possible if the determinant is not equal to zero. So two times four is eight, one times eight is eight. Up, oh, it can't be E because there we go, that's not helpful. What about uh, this one, Q? Four, four times two, one times eight is zero again. So that's no good to me at all. Right, let's look at the next one, P equals. Right, okay, so we now know that if we look at this one here, we can say that Q to the minus one then becomes equal to four, eight, one, two. Okay, four, eight, one, two. Now here's the little known fact that tells you if you are given the inverse of a matrix, if you have Q to the minus one and you inverse that again, you actually get back to Q. So if you got Q to the minus one and can take its inverse, then it will get you back to Q. Right, okay then. So let's look at the fact that we've got here P given to me. All right, we know that Q to the minus one is equal to P. So can I now take the inverse of this? Can I now raise this to the power of minus one to give me my original Q? Well, four times two is eight, one times eight is eight. And again, nope, that doesn't work. Oh, shuck. So we're now down to A or B. Right, let's look at A then. Okay, so let's look at part A and let's just see what happens there. We've got R is equal to two, eight, one, and four. We know from this that R is the transpose of P. So I can go and say that P then is two, eight, one, and four. And again, we know from here that P is Q to the minus one. So I now know that Q to the minus one is two, one, eight, four. So again, let's check. If I now raise this to the power of minus one, is it possible to work out that to the power of minus one? Well, two times four is eight, eight times one is zero. And again, so no, a is not possible. If I swap that one and four around, and we give it the four and one, then this becomes four and one, this becomes four, eight and one, and if we look at my determinant, I get two times one minus eight times four, it is going to be possible to do that. So this is only gonna be possible with B as my correct answer. Whew, that was the longest 15 minutes of my life, but I've seen that question come up before and it was actually quite, quite clever. Okay, moving on to question number seven. Very exciting, we like this one. Uh, Max is a baker who makes and sells different types of cakes. The following table is an example of how Max records the price of each cake and the number of cakes he sells each day, right? Max wants to set up a matrix equation that will allow him to determine the total number of cakes sold each week. So I'm on the total number of cakes sold each week. So we want those added together and the total sales in dollars made from selling all of his cakes. Okay, the total number of sales, so that's gonna be uh, each of these values multiplied together and then added. Okay, right. So we only want two pieces of information. And uh, the trick to this question was saying, well, if we look at A and the order of the matrix that would have been created, that was a one by four and a four by one. Well, that's only gonna give me a one by one. It can't be A. That's gonna give me a one by four and a four by four. 
Again, that's going to give me a one by four. That's going to give me four pieces of information. I don't, I want two. And again, in the same way, it can't be E. So we're now down to B and D. Now we like the one here. I like this summing matrix. Why do I like this summing matrix? Because it's going to sum those values together. It's going to sum A, B, C, D, and uh, A, B, C, and D together. But actually, I don't want it to sum A, B, C, and D together. I want it to sum E, F, G, H together. So if we just check E, F, G, H, one, 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 one. If we do that, we're going to add up. That will be the total number of cakes sold. If I then do E. F, G, H times A, B, C, D is going to give me those two values multiplied together, plus those two number, plus those two, plus those two. I'm going to say that D is, in fact, my correct answer. God, these questions are awesome and a little bit confusing. Okay, so now moving on to question eight. A group of 400 workers is based at four different locations, J, K, L, and M. The matrix of recurrence relation below is used to model the way in which workers change location from week to week. Okay, considering the following five statements about the information above, how many of these statements are true? Okie dokie. The highest number will always be at K. Right, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is bring up my calculator. Now, I've already defined here my T, my transition matrix, and I've put in S1 as well. The highest number will always be at K. So assuming I'm going to be using this rule to go from uh, state to state to state, Let's see what happens. J, 130K, 150, 70, and 50. So let's do T. Uh, let's do, so we've got S1 already. Let's do T times my answer. Gives me 100. Oh, hold on a moment. The highest number will always be K. Nope, because of that situation, J is certainly higher than K. So that one isn't right. So that's a no. All four numbers in matrix S0 are equal. Well, to do, the way to be able to do that, what we do is we're going to do T to the power of minus 1, and I'm going to multiply that by S1, which is going to give me my uh, matrix. So obviously, I'm using my matrix algebra to go backwards there. All four numbers in matrix S0 are equal. They are absolutely, so that's a yes. 30% of workers at L one week will remain at L the following week. So L to L, that's that value there. Yep. 30% will be there. Of the workers who started at J, 20 will still be at J two weeks later. No idea whatsoever. I have no idea whether those 20 will still be there or not. I, I, I think that's a trick. In the long term, the number at K to the nearest whole number will be 152. All right, so let's go back to S1. Let's do that. Let's do T times answer. Oops, he says. All right, let's go one. So what do we got to do? The long term, the number at K to the nearest whole number will be 152. So K is that. So let's keep going. And there we go. If I keep doing my calculator and keep going longer and longer and longer, it would appear that yes, to the nearest whole number, it's going to be 152. So we like that one as well. So there we go. Uh, let's cross that one through. That's not true. And so I'm going to go with the correct answer there for C. And there we go. Let's do that one there. If you see stuff flashing behind me, um, it is obviously my green screen trying to come through. Right, here we go. The graph below represents a friendship network. The vertices represent four students, K, L, M, and N. An edge represents the presence of a friendship between a pair of these students. For example, the edge connecting K and L shows Khan and Louis are friends. Good. Which of the following statements is true? All of the students are friends with Khan. No, because M isn't. So I'm going to cross that one through because there's no connection there. Khan is a friend of Louis and Mario. Uh, no, because we've just said that Khan isn't a friend with Mario. Louis is a friend of Mario. Louis is no, because there's no direct connection. Mario is a friend of Nico and Khan. Nope. And so I'm hoping it's E. Nico is a friend with all three of the students. Yes, the reason being is because Nico has connections to all three of the students. So I'm going to say E is my correct answer. I like that one. That was a nice question. The graph below has eight vertices labeled A to H. Which of the following is not a Hamiltonian path? Okay, a Hamiltonian path will go through and visit all of the points. Okay, Whew. so let me see. What have we got? Uh, I'm going to highlight. So we've got A, B, C. Oh, what's going on here? A. Would you like A to B, B to C, C to H, H to G, to D, to E, to F. That one is good. Let's try that one again. Let's roll that through. B, C, H. So B, C, H, A, G, D, E, F. That one is. Okay, next one. C, E, F, C, D. What? C, D, E, F. All right. 
C D E F A G H A what A G A A G H back to A nope it can't be that one it's got to be C C is incorrect okay so as far as I'm concerned B is not even on there and again there are lots of ways of doing this I like coloring in yes I should have done studio arts lol a network of tracks connects the entrance of a park to the exit as shown in the directed graph below the arrow show the direction that visitors can travel along each of the tracks and the number shown in the track capacity in visitors per second the capacity of the cut shown is now when we've got capacity of cuts we want to make sure that my water or people are flowing from the source to the sink so from the left of the dotted line to the right so let's color in that line that one there is that one there isn't the sorry that one where there is the two isn't so this one here is going the wrong way across my cut that one is so now what i'm going to do is 11 and 9 and 7 which gives me 27 as my correct answer or at least that's the answer i would put if i was doing this exam consider the graph below the number of edges that must be added to create a connected planar graph with 12 vertices and three faces right for it to be planar it's got to have vertices very fat elephants equals two so vertices plus faces minus edges we've got 12 vertices We've got three faces. We want to try and work out what that's going to give. So 15 minus what value gives me two? 13. So this has to have 13 edges. How many has it got at the moment? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13. Using my fingers means that I would have to add four edges to this diagram. All right. Again, very fat elephants. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go to my YouTube channel. Here we go. Now, before I do this, can you subscribe to my YouTube channel? If you haven't already, please do so. Very needy, but who watches math videos other than you now? And you're only watching the questions you want anyway. So if you can subscribe, that would be greatly appreciated. Turn off notifications if you don't ever want to hear from me again. But just knowing that you've watched this video really, really makes my day. Yeah, If I get like five subscribers at the end of the day, I go nuts. Like seriously, my dog thinks I'm a lunatic. Thank you. Right, Marjorie drives from her home to the office where she works. The network below shows the distances in kilometers using a series of roads connecting Marjorie's home to the offices. The, da -da 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 -da. the shortest distance in kilometers for Marjorie to travel from her home to the office. So we're going from the home and we're going to go to the office and we're going to use Dijkstra's algorithm. Oh, yes, we are. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to zoom in so that I can actually make life a little bit easier. And obviously, if you remember, for Dijkstra's algorithms, you go along. He says, doing the wrong button, going along each of the paths and you're trying to find out the shortest distances. So from there to there is 16. From E is 7 and f is 11 right so there's my zero put it in a box where's my smallest value there it's seven put it in a box we're now at e right e to b is seven plus seven is 14 seven plus 15 gives me 22 seven plus the five seven eight nine ten eleven twelve that gives me 12 but i can get to f in uh only 11 and i think that's it seven plus eight is 14 15 oh bit of a trick bit of a trick i can go seven plus eight uh, and i can actually get there quicker than the 16 so seven 14 15 so i'm now going to delete that and I'm going to put 15 on there. So what have we got? We've got 15, we've got 14, we've got 11, we've got a 22. So I'm at 11. Let's put a box around that one. Let's work out all of my tracks. 11 plus 5 gives me 16. I've already got 7 there. That's no good. Right, 11 plus 10 gives me 21. So I'm going to get there in 21. 11 plus 13 gives me 20. 11 plus 10 gives me 21. 11 plus 13 gives me 24. No good. 11 and 19 gives me 19, 20, that gives me 30. Right, where's my smallest number? Now it would be 14. 14 plus 9 gives me 23. Uh, 20, 15 and 5 gives me 20, that's no good. 23, I think I'm done there. My next smallest number would be 15, uh, but there's no point, all right? Uh, where did I get 15 from? That should be 16. Oh, I can't read my own handwriting, all right? But anyway, still the smallest number, 16. Right, where am I next? My next smallest number would be 21. 21 plus 4 gives me 25. I can still get there in less. 21 plus 6 gives me 27. So I can get there in 27. So there's my 27. Um, and there we go. That's that. And let's look at my next one. This number is 23. 23 plus 8 gives me 31. 27. So as far as I'm concerned, 
Whew, I can get there in 27. Let's just zoom those back in. And let's scroll up and see whether 27 is in fact one of my answers. It is. So 27, I would give B as my correct answer. All right, now again, if I've made any mistakes on there, my apologies. I'm trying to do this under the glaring studio lights. Um, but yes. Question number six, the adjacency matrix above. Uh, what does it show me? Uh, represents a graph with five vertices. Which one of the following statements regarding this graph is true? It is plain out right. No way. Am I going to be able to look at this and just know that? I, I mean, maybe you can, but I'm certainly not going to try. So it's P. He says doing it again. Come on. No highlighter. No highlighter. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can just draw that. I've got P, Q, R, S, and T. P, Q, R, S, and T. You're going to say, why did I draw it like that? I don't know. P to Q has got one. Is this thing symmetrical? Yep. I think it is. Two, one, two, yep. Uh, one, one, yep. Okay, symmetrical, good. Uh, P to R has, Q has one. P to R has two. So let's draw that like that for the moment. P to S has one. And P to T has one. Thank you very much. Right, so we've done P. Uh, P to Q has one. We got that one. Uh, Q to Q has one, so there's a loop. So I've done that one. Q to R has one. Uh, Q to S has one. And Q to T has one. And I'm going to draw it like this because it's got the word planar in there and I want to try and make sure I don't do any of mine crossing. R to P has two. We've already got that one. R to Q has one. We've already got that one. R to R, no loop. R to S has one. And R to T has none. Thank you very much. S to P has one. I've already got that one. Yep. Uh, S to Q has one. Yep. S to R has one. Yep. S to S, zero. And S to T has one. Oh, S to T has one. There we go. Uh, T to P has one. Yep. T to Q has one. Yep. T to R, zero. Yep. T to S, one. Yep, yep. All right. Can you zoom back out for me, please? Thank you very much. Right. Uh, what have I got here? So it is planar. Yes, it is definitely planar because I've got nothing that is crossing. Yep. Okay. So let's just go back to this because I feel like I am talking out loud and not making a lot of sense. Right. It is planar because there are no crosses. It contains two loops. No, we can see blatantly from there. It doesn't contain two loops. It contains an Eulerian circuit. For it to be an Eulerian circuit, I think it's got to be all even degrees. And I've got two odd degrees. All right. So that there would be an Eulerian path. Eulerian path, Eulerian trail, whichever one it is. And the reason being is I've got two odds. So I'll be able to get around here by starting at the five, but I'll end up at the three. Uh, the sum of the degrees of the vertices equals 21. No, it doesn't. All right, because that basically there uh, stands for two degrees and it contains three vertices of odd degree. We've just said it doesn't. So it's got to be A. All right. And I don't know how you would have done that without drawing the diagram. Oh, here we go. Okay, so now moving on to question number seven, you will see that I've already done a load of working out because this took some time. It's Hungarian algorithm. Okay, so long story short, we've got a Hungarian algorithm problem. And the trick to the question was turning around and saying that uh, the production manager assigns each worker a task that will minimize the total population. The reason I knew it was Hungarian algorithm was because it said minimize the total production completion time. Diego and Eden swap their assigned tasks. They actually swap it after. So what you've got to do is you do it once and then you sort of go, oh, hold on a moment. This will result in an increase in total completion time. So you've got to do it once and then you think about your answers. Right, so just talking through the process and this should be in your summary books, yeah? What do we do? We look at the rows and then we say, okay then, where's the smallest number? So minus nine, you take away nine from each of those. 11 was the smallest in this one. Eight was the smallest in this one, eight was the smallest in that one, and 10 was the smallest in one one. So my first pass diagram was this one here. So all I did was take away nine from each row, that gave me my first pass. And if you remember what do you have to do then, you try and cover all the zeros in the least number of ways possible. And when you do that, you basically can only ever go the least number is two. Now, because that's not equal to the tasks allocated, guess what you got to do? Well, yep, you do it all again. So, Having done that, I then look at my columns and I was like, well, okay, there are two columns there with no zeros in it. Uh, or in fact, there were three columns with no zeros in it. So you look for the smallest number there, which was four, smallest number there, which was three, smallest number there, which was eight, and you do it all again. So these two columns here stayed the same. 
I took four off of each of those, three off of each of those, eight off of each of those, and then what do you do? You look and you work out to see whether, yes, you can do your zeros. And in that situation, three lines, which wasn't very helpful in any way, shape, or form, and so I had to do the next stage, which, uh, remember, is that where you have uh, uncovered numbers, you look for the smallest uncovered number, you add it to anywhere where there are two lines crossing. So you'll notice that one became a three, that zero became a two, and then you took it away from all of the uncovered numbers. So that's one, this one here. All right, what do I do then? Well, I colored in my, my lines and the least numbers were five and I've got five things to allocate. And so I started allocating tasks. How did I do that? Well, the first thing I said was, well, look at the one that has only got one zero in a row. So in that situation here, a could only do task two. So I joined A with task two. Is there anyone else with only one zero? No. Then I looked at D because task two is now gone. So D, the only task that D could do then was task three. So that's now task two and three gone. So I'm now looking for someone who, well, task E could do two, three, or four. So they've already gone. So E had to do four. And so it went on. Right, so having done that, I then went back to my original, I allocated my task and said, well, okay, A is going to do task two, B is going to do task five, C is going to do task one, D is going to do task three, and E is going to do task four. Okie dokie. Having done that, oh, sorry, the pieces, I looked back at my original table and I went, right, well, how long does task two take? Nine minutes if A does it. How long does task five take? 19 minutes if B does it. How long does task C take? Eight minutes. I looked down all of these values, added them together, and told me that the original allocation, if no swaps had taken place, would have taken 65 minutes. But D and E swapped. So the first three numbers you'll notice didn't change because A and B didn't change. But the trick again was to say, well, now that task that D was doing task four, I had to look up and say, how long would it take D to do task four? E would have done task three. How long did it take? Add all those values together, and I can see that the difference between 65 and 69 is four minutes. Now, again, this is designed to take time, right? These are why these questions are at the end, and my advice to everybody doing these is to make sure you leave them until the last few questions, because that time could have killed you getting lots and lots of other marks elsewhere. Right, question number eight. Let's see how this one goes, shall we? A project has 11 activities, A to K. The table below shows the duration of each activity, the earliest start time and the latest start time. All times are in weeks. In this project, the number of activities that have exactly two immediate predecessors is. Right, I did this question, and I'm going to tell you now, it was something else. Uh, because you had to try and draw it together. Now, I know lots of people did it in different ways. Let's see if I can try and replicate it now. Right, uh, earliest start time, zero, zero, and zero. So A, B, and C have to come off the same thing. So A, B, and C all have to come off the, the, the beginning. Yes, there's A, B, and C. So I know A has a duration of seven, B has a duration of six, and C has a duration of nine. So I'm going to make these a little bit longer. I'm going to do some dots. Now, I know, therefore, I've got boxes here. And uh, let's see. So early start times are 0, 0, and 0. So it now, so I've done my A, B, and C. D has an earliest start time of 6, a latest start time of 6. So D has to follow on from B. That's what I did next. I said, okay, well, D has a time of 2. It's got an earliest start time of 6. E has an earliest start time of six as well. All right, so again, if E, I basically said, well, okay, E is going to come off here. Let's draw that again. So I had E, and that was comma five. And again, I had that as an earliest start. So basically, I just drew lines coming off of everything all over the place. F has an earliest start time of eight. Well, I was basically assuming then that F was going to come off of there. So F was going to have an early start time of 6. So that's going to be a 6. And it's going to have 8 there. Now, a lot of people that I spoke to said, well, hold on a moment. We're just going to look for all the ones that were effectively on the critical path as well. Okay, that's a way of doing it. I've got a feeling I'm going to run out of room. Let's see where I was. Did I do F already? I did F. G8, earlier start time of 8. So again, I had G coming off of here. All right, G took eight, 
And again, it's got 8,8. .8. H was 4. So again, I had H here because uh, basically 6, uh, 12, 13, 14, earliest start time of 14. Uh, what did I have here? I, earliest start time of 14. Let me just move my diagram over a moment. Here we go. I has an earlier start time of, oh, no. Think about what you're doing. I has an early start time of 14. Let's try that one again. I takes three. And again, early start time of 14. J, two. Comma two. That has to be 18. All right, and then K, basically uh, early start time of 20. So K had to come off of here, and that took five, and again, it was 20. All right, so my completion time of this whole project was 25, and that's what we wrote there. Now, then I basically looked at the latest start time. So for 20 to 20, K had to be in my critical path. Uh, so that's that one there, J, 18 to 18. Yep, so 20 minus two give me 18, right, I, had to start, the latest start time was 17, all right? So this value here had to be gained by, what was it, 17? 14, 15, 16, 17. Early start time was 14, latest start time was 17. So where did that connect into? 20 minus five, nope, 18. Sorry, 20 minus 2 gives me 18, 18. So, a number minus uh, 3 had to give me that 17. So, that's annoying. I can't remember how to do this question. Okay, so because I've got to do a number minus three has got to give me the 17 in there, it's got to be 20, all right? So in which case, that's got to go and connect in here, I think. Yes, uh, because I've got my latest start time there, so 20. So again, I've got this 20 here, minus the three gives me the 17. So there's my J connected. Uh, what have we got? H, 14 and 14, that's already on the critical path. Leave that one there for the moment, right? What have we got? We've got a G, 8 and 10. So I've got a duration of 8, and I've got to get that to 10. So a number minus 8 has got to give me 10. So what have we got here? So 18 minus that gives me 14. We already knew H on the critical path. So 14 minus 8. What is that? 14 minus 8 gives me 6. So that's no good. Let's do that 8 there. Uh, 17 minus 8, nope, um, 18 minus 8, so what a value I want here, I want that as 10. So uh, basically I've got to have that connected into 20 minus 10, 18, I've got to have that connected into J, I've got to have that connected into J, so I'm going to change this one here, and I'm going to move that to here, and I know that's a curve, so let's try that one again. That's an, oh, it's not a very good curve. Sorry, guys, I know this is taking a long time. Let's have that one there. So what was that? That was G we were working on, and that had 8. We had to have 8 and 10. So let me just check, is that true? So we've got 18 minus the 8 gives me 10. There we go. So that's that one there. Uh, F is on the critical path, we know. E we got to work out where to connect it. So something minus five has got to give me nine. So nine and five gives me 14. It's got to connect into the end of here. So it has to connect into the end of there because that 14 minus my five has got to give me nine. We've done that one there. Six and six is already on the critical path, so we'll leave that one there. And then uh, we've got to work out far. Doo -doo -doo, latest start time is five. So something minus nine has got to give me that five. So something minus nine has got to give me the five. So that's 14. It's got to connect into where there is a 14. Mm -mm. So it's got to connect into where there's 14. No, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to do C. Yep. So that's actually got to connect into here, I think. 
Yeah, because 14 minus 9 gives me 5. And then what have we got here? 6 and 0 and 0. So it's got to be 6. Uh, sorry, let's try that one again. Let's undo that one there. That's got to be 0. And then we've got this A hanging, so 8. It's got to connect into where there's 8. That would have to connect into there. So that the 8 minus 7 would give me the 1. Now, fingers crossed, that is my diagram. Let's just check. Now, while checking, I probably realized that half of that diagram was off the screen. So what I'm actually going to do is move it up into view there. My apologies if I was working on it outside of the screen. But maybe it was important to see the table as well. Right. The, the part of the question that was actually mapped was, in this project, the number of activities that have exactly two pre immediate predecessors is... Oh, here we go. The immediate predecessors is... Uh, now, that basically means that anywhere that is coming in, that has got two things coming into it, will have an immediate predecessor. So, uh, there is two lines coming in here. And so, that means anything that's coming off of there has two immediate predecessors there and there. All right, so, so far we got that and that. Uh, we got two lines coming into there. So, J has an immediate predecessor. Anything else? We've got two lines coming in. And so, K has an immediate predecessor. Anything else? Although I've got two lines coming into. Nope. That's got two lines going out. So basically, as far as I'm concerned there, the correct answer would be, he says, trying to get his highlighter, and four. Oh, that was a long paper. All right, there we go. Thank you very much for watching. That is this part done. All right, okay. If you sat this paper and had sat the geometry or linear, I'm really sorry, but because those modules are no longer relevant to the new study design, I'm probably not going to record it. This video has been long enough. If you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, please do so. All the resources there on Maths Guru if you want to go back and teach yourself any of this stuff, if you can't remember. Uh, but otherwise, hopefully, I'll see you in the paper two solutions. All right, take care. Bye-bye.